Hello, everyone. We are here today in this webinar with Dr. Jorge Campos Aliaga from Spain. Hi, Doc. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, before I introduce him, I uh, would like to speak a little about uh, some initiatives that we are taking at the Global Summit. The Universal School of Health is the new reality and uh, at first uh, initiative, we are starting the Doctorate of Healthcare Business Program. I'm proud to introduce the first program in the world that closes the gap between uh, clinical training and real life business. A human for doctors, uh, empowering us to be successful CEOs and community leaders. As healthcare professionals, we all go through rigorous training, achieving clinical competency over years of professional education. But it's impossible to fit everything uh, in our busy schedule, including the business training that we need to do uh, to be ready for the future that we have above. So we at the Global Summits are starting the Doctorate of Healthcare Business, which will help you close this gap. Doctors from all over the world are sharing their uh, backgrounds in research, publishing, innovation, team building, sales psychology, business scaling, and marketing. This unique team will be augmented by outstanding global industrial leaders as uh, guest lecturers who will share cutting edge knowledge in their respective fields. Also, uh, something else that I would like to, you to know is that the Hippocratic accreditation is available for everyone that's work. It's accreditation for, from doctors of the healthcare industry without the corruption. In the last decades, third party service uh, product uh, organization have grown around accreditation organizations, professional schools, financiers, politicians, lobbyists, regulatory bodies, and whoever could exert the influence directly or indirectly interfering with the sacred patient-doctor relationship. Our noble profession has become more a marketing function and the public has lost faith in its uh, professionals and the healthcare industry also needs to be the trust restored. Hippocratic principles are the premise of our oaths and obligation to patients and the healthcare industry. First, do no harm. So leaders, namely doctors, should continue to guide the destiny of the noblest profession uh, as we have for thousands of years. Since we are entering in a world of globalization and integration in healthcare, domestic accreditation bodies do not have significant oversight, which has led to corruption and to uninvited corporatization to the healthcare industry. For the benefit of a few, monetary gain has become a great priority for those and no fraternity regardless, it, it taints the scientific method and to the sacrifice of healthcare professionals and their patients. To reestablish this, the Global Summit Institute, composed exclusively by doctors, dentists, pharmacists, optometrists, chiropractors, and healthcare philosophers, uh, as dominated by their peers, will be offering Hippocratic accreditation to any organization deemed worthy of this seal of approval including universities, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, service providers, regulatory agencies, product distributors, hospitals, private practices, domestic and international, operating within the healthcare supply chain. This mark, if earned by the organization, will confirm doctors and patients worldwide that the organization has undergone through review process and does not infringe upon their in her rights and relationships. So, hi, doctor. Hello. Uh, I showed some CV for the guys I, in, I invite, but I wrote, I uh, read, read your CV and then it was very nice and fascinating and I wanted to let you tell us something by yourself. So I see you come from a family of doctors. Oh, yes. my. Father is who is 101 year. He is <laughs> an orthodontist, and he has introduced the orthodontic techniques to uh, Argentina, where I am originally from. Argentina. My mother was a physician, 
and my brother uh, was a dental surgeon also. And my nephews are dentists. So we have a, a big family oh. of dentists. <laughs> like the football team, you know? Like the football team, yeah. yeah. I'm really on this these days. So, yeah, yeah. And uh, what about your education? I see you've got a PhD in 1981, if I'm correct, oh, yeah? Yes, uh, because I, by that time I was uh, giving um, classes at, at the university and I was in a physiology, you know, yeah. and I was giving classes there. So my, my PhD is uh, on blood, blood cells, the stem cells. This was my, and so I, I killed 5,000 mice, you know? <laughs> well, you know, sacrifice. I wouldn't say Yes, kill. I sacrificed, but, but physically 5,000 in three years. So that means that you have to inject um, uh, uh, you see, uh, radioactive uh, calcium, radioactive yeah. ferrum, just to analyze later where the blood comes from. That was the, my... That's fascinating. And then later on, tell me something about it. What have you done later? Lately, I moved to Spain uh, almost 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and now I am living in Spain and I, I dedicated them to aesthetics, orthodontic aesthetic. And since 1989, I, I'm doing uh, implantology. So uh, by, by that time, we, we knew very little uh, about implantology. Things yeah. can, have changed a lot. That's true, you know. But... Uh... Uh, you you have written that the first implants of place are still still in the mouth, you know? Yeah, it is it's still. And you so know like, like you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, I, I will tell you a funny thing. Yeah. I put the I put the implant in a patient who said I have to go to work to Argentina. Do you know any dentist in Argentina? I said, my brother. <laughs> so yeah. my brother put <laughs> the crown to the first implant I put it in Spain. This was it was an international job, so it didn't have to it, fail. It was a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. A funny coincidence. And then tell me something about uh, your pet research and the oh. presentation that we are going to have today. Okay. Um, the pet research uh, that I have done on dogs show us that we have a very serious technique that show us how very little we knew about bone biology. Because I'm going to talk about a technique, but I also I'm going to talk why do we have very big mistakes, many, very big problems, because we, we thought uh, one thing about bone biology that was completely wrong. And this technique demonstrates. So my conference will show at the beginning, very big mistakes that were done by me and, and, by very, and, and other colleagues that show some good mistakes after not one year, not two years, but after 12 years, you see that there is a disaster. So you, the learning curve is very slow because you think that it's a success but after 12 years or 16 years, you see that this is a disaster. So how can we avoid this? I've got the solution. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I know what you are going to talk about. It's gonna be socket shield. And mm -hmm. uh, I trust because I'm one of the guys around that works with it. And uh, I'm one of the oh. guys that also cleans lots of teeth for a living. So, Ah. I, I really believe what you are uh, doing. Uh, okay. So, without further ado, so please go on with your presentation and good luck and thank you for being here with us. Today. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. The conference is Socket Shield Technique, a new era. 
So uh, I'm a member of the PET research group. And you can see here, there are the members, uh, Howie Glockman and Jonathan Dutrat from South Africa, Maurice Salama, and also David Garber from the United States, Snejana Paul from Chile, Marcelo Ferrer, Darcio Fonseca from Portugal, Joy Chain, and Isaac Tawil, Salah Weiss, Charles Schwimmer, Richard Martin, Hakon Kuit, Yudata Kerr, and Armando Ponzi. So uh, this, all professionals here believed in this technique 10 years ago. So we begin doing and practicing and exchanging information. And we make a, a technique that we develop the technique that we use nowadays. So the important thing is why you should do socket shield. Second, how can you do it? And third, what do you obtain? This is how we are, will organize the presentation. But first of all, is why do we need to practice this presentation? So do we, we begin with the why. When you see the why, you have to, first of all, understand which is the problem we are facing. Second, what do we know about bone biology? And third, why does it happen? So. We, we begin now. First, the why. Why do we do this? This is me in 2007. I was running a master course here in Spain. And this is a case from uh, one student of mine. And you can see it was, uh, we extract a whole a full extraction case. You see, we were happy showing why we extracted the teeth. Look at this, and then we put the implants, you see, more or less in the middle of the crest. Hmm? We have a little bit of bone there. But look at the result 12 years later. What happened here? We are facing the implants. Look at this. It looks like the, the implant is has been put outside the bone envelope. And more of this, look at the, the CBCT image. You see that it, there is no bone surrounding our implants. And I want to show you more cases like this. This is not mine, but it came to my office. This is another one from another doctor. And here is a case of a recently case from a friend of mine, Dr. Chuck Schwimmer. You know, here they extracted the teeth by caspid. So he inserted the implant more going palatally. You see, this is the implant integrated. The implant is well positioned. And this is the result. Look at this. We have better gingiva here, hate comparing to the natural teeth. But two years later, look at this. There is no buccal bone. <laughs> so what, what I'm going to, to tell you today is to show you that you have to begin looking at this. You, can you see there is a little shadow here? There is a depression because there is no bone because we extracted the tooth, okay? So in an article that says the buccal bone crest dynamics after implant placement and rich preservation techniques show us that immediate implant placement does not prevent the bone resorption, okay? The regeneration of the gap after immediate implant placement only limits the resorption of the buccal bone crest. I want to show you this is a spectacular case from a friend of mine, Dr. Joy Kahn from the United States. And he said, in 1997, this was one of the first immediate implants made in the world. And I showed this case all over the world from 1997 to 2003. Then the patient disappeared. He, she moved to live to Russia, 
because uh, of uh, the business of his uh, husband. And suddenly she wrote an email and says, Dr. Joe can, uh, I need to see you desperately. And she sent an image and this happened. So Dr. Joy Khan asked, does it only happen in California? Because look at the implant, looks like it's outside completely of the bone. And he said, I was sure that I put the implant, I insert the implant in the correct place, but why is here? So, he resumed in, in, a, in a video, in a presentation at dentalxp.com, what tissue changes can we expect with anterior implant therapy? And he shared with us that from 1997 to 2003, he did no graft at the immediate implants. Because he had poor results, he changed the technique and they grafted the gap from 2003 to 2009, but after a couple of years, they also tried to improve the technique, grafting the gap and the fascia. You can see that they graft outside the bone and also they put a, a connective tissue graft. So he says, this only happens in California because till 2016 nobody was talking about this kind of problems the problems are the medium and long term of immediate implants and he says that this is inevitable but i don't think it's inevitable that's why my presentation shows i want to share with you another case look at this this canine, they have to extract this canine because the crown, it, it falls rapidly and they want to put an implant. They extract the canine, the root. And look what happened. The big, the huge defect. Why? Because here we have the, the, this bone, this big bone that sustains the, the papilla is maintained by the PDL from this root. When you extract, you have from, from this level, you go to this level. Then this explains why do you have this poor result? Because you don't have any papilla anymore. You see, this is a horrible situation with a big, big resorption. Okay, you can see many, many cases like this. The patient says, I, I, I think is a gray shadow over my tooth here, my implant. And when you probe, you can feel there is no buccal bone. So, which are the consequences of the immediate implantology? To have the Spiderman, <laughs> Spiderman implants that are attached only to the back like in this image. So for many years, we were thinking why this is happening. And so we made the same questions that with nat natural teeth. It is because inadequate keratinized gingiva root prominence or the brushing because thin by a tap or inflammation. Can we apply this criteria to implants? The answer is no. I want to show you three articles that explain which is the problem. And we begin to realize that this is a huge problem that we are facing now. The first was a surprise in Goran Benik in 2011 because they were looking for another thing. They were looking for what happened to the buccal bone and the mucosa in implants, Im immediate implants after seven years. And they study with a cone beam computed tomography. So they study 24 implants and they were all type one sockets. 
That means that you have complete bone surrounding your implant. When the gap was over 0.5 millimeters, they fill it with uh, bios and they cover it with a membrane that is bio guide. And after four to six months, they restore with a porcelain fused metal. Okay. So they also measure this the width of the keratinized gingiva. And what they found that at the initial, the, um, there was 3.6 millimeters hmm, on average of keratinized gingiva. But after seven years, they found they, they have only have 2.4. They lose 33% of the keratinized gingiva. And look at this, but this is more risky because we are arriving to the two millimeters threshold when the perimplantitis begins. You can see the article of Canulo 2015, okay? So they put a radio pack of resin on the gingiva, on the buccal of the implants, and after that, they take the CBCT image just to uh, understand the relationship between the gingiva and the buccal bone. And they measure also the distance from the shoulder of the implant to the crest, to the bone crest. And the beginning was a, a, an average of 2.1 millimeters. And after seven years, they found that there was 5.4 min, minus minus plus minus 4.7. Why? Because they found that some cases there were no buccal bone. And the conclusions they say, the fact that the buccal bone plate was visible only in the 65% of the cases and absent on the 35% of the cases is the most striking finding of the present study. They didn't expect to find this. Okay, this is just one article. Let's see 2011. Let's see uh, and remember that four of these five sites they were initially treated with guided bone regeneration with xenoplastic allograft. Okay. In this article from Yasukazu Miyamoto and Tadakazu Obama, dental convincing computer tomography analysis of postoperative labial bone thickness in maxillary anterior implants, they want to compare delayed versus immediate implants. So, they have three groups. First group is guided bone regeneration. They did the extraction and they regenerate with a non resorbable membrane and bios, two stages. Then the second group is a guided bone regeneration, but with a resorbable membrane and also the same biomaterial, bios. And the third group, they did extraction and immediate implantation and the gap filling with the autologous bone. Well, what do they find? Look at this. Cases one, better bone, group two, and group three. The conclusions. The group one with the non-resolvable membrane maintains the better bone. Second group, 50% gingival recession and vertical bone loss. And in group three, 71% remarkable gingival recession and vertical bone loss at six months later. So we have very, very big problems during the immediate implants. So the conclusions were incredible. This result suggests that immediate implant placement may require technical modifications so that healthy heart tissues can be preserved. Maintaining, and I want you to understand this, maintaining two millimeters of labial bone thickness after completion of restorative treatment. And my question is, why two millimeters? You know why? 
because there is an article of Wally Grunder in 2005 that he said that we need two millimeters because there is a bone resorption on the outside of our implant because the prosthetic connection. So he said, we need these two millimeters. And because we had these problems, we changed the technique and we said, we need smaller implants, small diameter implants. This is what our conclusion in the anterior thumb. And we have to put the implants more palatally. You see? Okay. Because we want to have aesthetics, but this is not the solution. Here begins to, the solution of our problem begins with this article. Rich alteration post-extraction in the aesthetic zone. You can see here an article from Vivian Chapuis and Danny Boucher and many other collaborators. The study sample were 39 cases. They consisted of 18 women and 21 men. And they did two CBCT, one post-extraction at eight weeks. So they did one extraction and they do a one CBCT and eight weeks later, the second one. So they superimposed by anatomical landmarks eh, and with a software die to mesh, okay? And what do they found? They found something very interesting. And it was the major found that when the thickness of the labial wall of the socket was over one millimeter, the, the percentage of vertical bone resumption was very, very low. And when the thickness of the facial bone was very thin, they have high resorption. So look at this. If we make a group, different groups of the thick biotype, they found that there is a very, very little resorption. And in the thin wall, there is a very huge resorption. So they described two biotypes, the thick phenotype and the thin phenotype. Look at these character images, the thick phenotype after the extraction and eight weeks later, if you can see still the buccal wall. And on the other side, the thin biotype, you cannot see it. And after the superimposition, you see that there is an average of 7.5 millimeters of resorption, vertical resorption, uh, or 1.1 millimeters of vertical resorption in the thick biotype, okay? And though there is a critical facial bone wall thickness, okay, of one millimeter. According to the study of Guy Haimba and Mariano Sanz, in the analysis of the socket bone wall dimensions in the upper maxilla in relation to immediate implant placement, you can see here in the anterior buccal bone wall that in 93 cases, the buccal bone uh, thickness is in the 87% of the cases, 64 plus 23, less than one millimeter. So, we have here described the bone biotype, and we, we know the gingiva biotype. So, but these numbers that do not correlate, so you have here uh, a problem because we used to talk about thin biotype, but in the gingiva, 30% of the cases, and the thick biotype is 70. But if we talk about bone, it's just the opposite. Bone biotype thin is huge and thick bone biotypes are few, very few. 
So next Monday, when you're going to do an extraction on the upper incisor, is more probably almost 90% that your patient has a very thin biotype. So be careful. Okay, what do we know about bone biology? Because this is the problem we are facing, just to see the threats of our implants. So we know that bone needs vascularization because the organization of the cells on the bone. When the bone is very, very dense, depends on this vascularization, okay? And the bundle bone, we propose, I said, uh, Chuck Schwimmer especially, propose an, another name that is tooth-related bone, because it's a very special bone of our whole body that, that is completely compact and needs the help of the PDL. When we train our students and we talk about uh, the school, the, the dental school, uh, about the PDL, what do we figure about PDL? Periodontal ligament. We think about fibers. So we think, we are accustomed to think the PDL that the most important part are fibers. And we describe the fibers, descending, transverse, many, many kinds of fibers. And all our students think about the PDL like fibers. But you have to understand that 70% of the volume of the PDL is vascularization, not fibers. You can see these images that are very interesting. These are the vascularization of the gingiva, and I want to show you the vascularization of the PDL. When you strike the tooth, and you can see here the vascular network that is all over the socket between the bone and the root, you can see this network. So this vascular network that in, in histology images is like this, in the white spaces, round white spaces, shows that the connection between the vascularity of the PDL is helping nurturing the bone of the buccal wall of the sockets. So this is the buccal wall of the socket. Do you see, we used to think that the periosteum help nurture the, the buccal bone of the socket. But you can see that here, there is no entrance of the vascularization. You can see many, many vascularization that are shared between the PDL and the buccal bone, but no vascularization from the buccal in getting into the alveolus buccal bone. Remember this article. This article was very disturbing in our profession at the implantology profession in 2005. Araujo, Mauricio Araujo and Linde, Jan Linde, they say, they study the dimensional rich alteration following tooth extraction. It was a very, very simple uh, study. They just extracted the tooth. It was a premolar on a dog, big old dogs, and they compared what happened with the buccal bone height. And you can see that at the eight weeks, we have a big resorption of the buccal bone. But we thought, oh, but if we do the immediate implant, can we stop this process because of the Wolf's law? We, we, we were very naive. We thought that if we insert the implant, the implant will stimulate the bone and stop this resorption. And these authors, they did the study. 
dimensional retardation follows to the extraction. Hmm? And they conclude that the placement of an implant in the fresh extraction site obviously fails to prevent the remodeling that occurred in the walls of the socket. So we were helpless by that time. Okay. So we end at 2010 with this problem. And we have a, a why we end with this problem because we have bone biology ignorance, and we tried to do some strategies that were a complete failure. They, we we used to change in the implants the surface, the macro design, the technical surgery. We changed the biomaterials and the membranes just to stop the resorption of the buccal bone wall. But there is a biologic solution that are the partial extraction therapies. That is, the acronym is PET, that is, the socket shield is one of them. Okay. And I'll begin with this article of Don Hurseler and Otto Thur about, in 2010, the socket shield technique a proof of principle report. And he said, this is a very proof of principle report because they did only in just one dog. In one dog, in one beetle dog, the third and fourth premolar were emisected. You can see here. Buccal fragment of, of distal root was maintained. Here's the buccal. And one millimeter coronal to alveolar crest. Four implants were inserted palatal, here you can see, to the remaining root slices. Randomly, two implants out of four were inserted in contact to these remaining roots. And what did they found in the histologic evaluation done after four months? Principal findings, that the remaining roots here, you can see, has no sign of inflammation and the PDL, PDL look normal. Okay. But the most important thing is that root was attached to bone by a healthy periodontum. That means, you can see here, this is the, the, the root maintained. And you can see the PDL. And the most important part is that Retaining the buccal aspect of the root during an implant placement does not appear to interfere with its integration and may be beneficial in preserving the buccal bone plate because they found that the buccal bone plate was exactly at the same level of the lingual. Why? Because you maintain here the root, and the PDL that is nurturing the bone. So the main purpose of the socket shield is to maintain the buccal wall, maintain the periodontum, the keratinized gingiva with, and the gum vascularization, because give us aesthetics and defense to our implant. Okay, so how can we do the socket shield technique? It's a very simple concept. First of all, we have to do an horizontal cut. One millimeter above the gingiva because we want to preserve this gingiva, okay? Then we do a vertical cut. I begin with the diamond bore, the, the first part from mesial to distal, but Afterwards, we do with, a, with this um, burr, that is a, a bone cutter hmm, from Comet. Why is important? Because it has a long shaft. You can see that in, in these roots, you need a very long shaft to cut the whole root. After that, you extract very, very carefully the lingual part of the root 
and you can never, never put the elevator between the two parts of the route because you look say the buccal one. You don't need to touch the buccal part, okay? You just push in the mesial distal and lingual. And then you extract the whole lingual part. At the beginning, I used to measure this root. So what do we do with the buccal part? We need to treat the edge, okay? With the round ball diamond burr, we begin uh, grinding the buccal part. So all of these are members of the PET research group. And we gathered in Madrid in 2017 to get a consensus and how long, at what level, and I want to tell you exactly what were the, the conclusions of the consensus. So, implants in relation, does it matter? You can see cases here, almost touching, very close and very far away. You see, there is a very big gap. Does it matter? No, the conclusion is that it doesn't matter, okay? Apicocoronal height of the shield, because one member of the group were doing uh, living uh, like uh, Otto Thur, uh, uh, Hurseler, one millimeter above the bone. But we decided that at, the, at this uh, group that we need to put it at bone level. The, the shield must be at bone level and the implant must be one or two millimeters below the shield. Okay, this is very important. Okay, I want to share with you my first case of socket shield. And uh, this was done in, 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 in a member of my team. It, it's, it's a hygienist. So uh, I have to deal with this case my whole life. So. <laughs> This was the first one. I explained to her because by that time was a very experimental uh, technique, but I, I shared with her the importance of having, maintaining the buccal war. So she listened very carefully and said, yes, okay, let's do it. So we extract the, the palatal root of the premolar, and then I inserted an implant and I did immediate load, okay? We, we, I sealed with PRF, this is an abutment and a provisional crown with no occlusion, okay? One week, I, I, I almost took uh, every day a, a picture just to see what happened, but I don't want to show you <laughs> every day picture, but you can see there's a, the, one week, look at this gingiva, eight weeks. Yet yeah, at 16 weeks, I do the, the good impressions. I took impressions just to make the final crown. But look at this image, the seal that we feel around the abutment. This is the technique, one abutment, one time. You can see that it's completely sealed, no inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we, this is a normal porcelain metal fused crown. This is not zirconia because uh, we wanted to have a zirconia, but it was a, a mistake by the laboratory. And so we tried and as he said, no, it looks perfect. So we cemented. Day one, one week, one year. Okay, 1.5 years, another CBCT. We can see the bone there. Three years, okay, it looks good. It looks image is great. Six years is maintained. I can see the keratinized genes are perfect. Another CBCT, six years. You can see here the root. And 2021 with another combing, and you can see the bone is still there. 
there is no resorption. Interesting how bio biology works. So very, very important is the indications and contraindications of the roots that we can use. So a root with a buccal bone is indicated. Look at this case. We cannot use this incisor to do a socket seal. With or without root treatment canal, endo. Yes, we can use these, these uh, roots, okay? Preferably without apical infection, but we can do work on these cases also. As far as there is buccal bone attached to this root, we do an apicoectomy uh, simultaneously to the implant placement. Um, first, most important, healthy gums. We need healthy gums, no pockets. In these cases, we are not using these cases. I want to show you, this is a very, very tough case. The patient is a very young man, 25 years old, a sailor, and he said, oh, they, 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 want the, they sent me to you because uh, I need to strike this central incisor. Why? Because they, they, they have infection and they have repeatedly two apicoectomies without success. So um, they, I have to strike this root. And I say, okay, but we are going to do a special technique to try to, you can see here, there is buccal bone here. Here, there is the apicoectomy. So I raise a flap, maintaining the papillas, looking that this is, was the whole of the apicoectomy. I cut the, the crown horizontally. You can see here, then the mesiodistal cut. It's very, very important, that the, a big detail of a professional that when you do the horizontal cut, don't touch the papilla, the mesial and distal papilla, because if you do so, you, you, you make damage, you are ruining the bone there, see? And so you may have issues with the papilla. So be careful not to touch this papilla. I extracted the palatal part of the root and you can see this was previously done. And we have this. So we prepare the bevel of the buccal part. And this is the important part, okay? Remember the Hurseler, and this is the most important part to maintain <coughs> this bone because there is PDL on the back. You can see the implant here situated. After form, the patient uh, used a removable tooth and she went to, to sail. And after four months, he came back. You can see the healing. Then you can see how nice is preserved the buccal bone. You can see the implant. And I put a provisional tooth. And this is what you have to see, the profile, the buccal profile and the quality of this gingiva. Okay, in another case, in a later case, I will show you the difference between the real thing and a connective tissue graft that is not the same. Looks like, but it's not the same. The quality of the gingiva, this is the important part. Okay, so we have both tooth. This is the implant. This is the real tooth. Hmm? You can see the implant and how nice you can see this part. This, this, you have to be a specialist in analyzing this, not only the height, but also the quality, the, the light on the gingiva. In 2019, three years later, we maintain this, and in 2021, six years later, you can see that the implant is okay, the gingiva is perfect, 
and there are no scars and the and the patient is happy but i am also very happy because um i know that it's very important to do this technique just to obtain this kind of results okay in my second second chill i did it stage it it is a very old case i extracted the palatal root and after one week i did a, a, a provisional a personalized uh, healing abatement and after 24 weeks when you want to do the, the the final you can see this look how nice is this image hmm? this image is incredible because there is no graft and no connective tissue graft in the buccal. This is the natural thing that you maintain just by simply remain, letting the, the, the root be there, okay? If you strike, you know what will happen. But if you remain the root there, you see the beautiful image that we have. This image for me is so nice that should be on the museums, you see, like a big, big picture must be there at the, at the Museo del Prado in Madrid. You, you should see images like this. Okay, I want to show you and share with you some other cases in the, in the aesthetic zone. We have to change here the, the crowns, but we have to extract one of these roots because it's completely decayed and we cannot do another uh, here, uh, another tick and an abatement. So we cut it, we re extract the palatal part, we insert the implant and the provisional. And so, and after two months, we have this scenario. Beautiful scenario, we change the crown. Hmm? And the day that we screw the crown, we have this nice keratinized gingiva. Mm -hmm. You can see the root here, and there is the apex there. Look at this. Wow. After, we have to see the naturality of this image. Two years later, and for four years later, they are completely natural, no graft on the gap, no connective tissue graft. Okay, what, what can be done with this technique? There are many other possibilities. For example, we have to talk about interproximal socket shield, uh, like used by guided bone regeneration, Molar socket shields, uh, how can we use in vertical fractures, socket shields, uh, anostectomy, ortho extrusion, uh, socket shield reutilization, and, and combine it with apicoectomy, and non aesthetic socket shield cases. Because at the beginning in 2013 and 14, we were doing only socket shields on the aesthetic area. But someday we begin doing socket shield on the lateral part of the maxilla and also on the lower mandible. And many people ask, begin to ask, why do you do socket shield in an area that is no aesthetic at all? For example, in, in a lower molar. And a friend of mine, Jack Schwimmer, they give, he give their, the correct answer. He says, because I don't want to lose no bone in any part of the mouth of my patient. I don't want to see how the buccal bone resorbs. So I just want to maintain what nature gives to our patients, that is the buccal wall. And we now know the secret that is keep the root, keep the bone. Okay. So Dr. Joy Khan did an article in 2000, uh, 
13, that is proximal socket shield for interimplant papilla preservation on the aesthetic zone. And so he inspired us to maintain the bone. And we had a problem, a very big problem. What do we do with adjacent implants? When we have to do the cases like this of immediate implants, we had the solution at that time that said we need to do only one implant and one pontic, because if you do two implants, you could that are very close, you can have this problem. So I want to show you a case of a patient that came to me like this and said, uh, I need to extract central and lateral incisor. And you can see that this papilla is smaller than this because there is there are two crowns here, there is some inflammation. And I said, okay, but I can do it perfectly because um, I, I know how to do a technique just to restore this in a perfect way. Fortunately, the man came this day with his wife because I proposed to the man to do first orthodontics to extrude the roots and extrude the bone to support the papilla. And the, the man, he didn't care, but the wife said, this is a very, very good idea. So we did this. We did the ortho extrusion. You can see the roots, there is the chronical problem here. Look at this problem, the infection on the apex. And this is a, a nice drawing, but it's not real. It's not real to maintain the big bone between implants. This is not true. So we need to do ortho, some time of retention, and then socket shield. And we did it because we, you can see the, the article of Maurice Salama, the role of orthodontic through with remodeling, that you can remodel the bone just simply by extruding the root. The bone is coming uh, with the root. We extruded, and after a time, I made a, a design of a socket shield like is the C shape. Why is a C-shape? Because we need to have PDL here and PDL here to support the papilla. I extracted and then I did a, an apicoectomy with an horizontal uh, incision because of this. Uh, it's very interesting, this uh, article that says that the, all the bases of the periosteum comes in a horizontal direction. So when you do a vertical cut to do it, to rise a flap, you are damaging very much than if you do an horizontal incision and then you open because it's very lax. So I open, I did the apicoectomy, guided uh, surgery, and then two implants and the two socket shields. And I did immediately load case, minor os, membrane, PRF, suture. And look at this, the profile of the bone maintained with an implant and the profile of the bone maintained with another implant. And this is the case, just restored. And look at this, the nice papilla between two implants. Hmm? This is superposition. And you can see here the implant. And there is a five millimeter papilla between two implants. After one year, we can you have to understand the biology of this zone and also of this zone to do a perfect treatment. Different images of the natural keratinized gingiva that we have. And here we have, I said, a sandwich, a bone sandwich between one shield, lateral, another, and the bone peak. From one year to another year, the bone is still there maintaining the papilla. Another case of, uh, you have to extract these two roots 
what will happen to the papilla? What will happen to the profile in just in the anterior zone? So I did a different design of socket shield here, but the result is, is that we obtained here a vertical papilla preservation and the horizontal profile of the case. Very naturally, you can see here and here. Two years and a half later, we have the same papilla. Okay, let's talk about Pontic Shield. In 2014, a group of uh, Austria, the, the uh, leader, the leader was Marco Glocker. They, they, they put an article that says rich preservation with modified socket shield technique. And the technique is very simple. You do a socket shield but you insert a, 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 a pericardium membrane, resorbable, and you insert it on buccal. You do a pocket and you insert the membrane. You don't insert the implant, just leave it, the, the cloth, and you, you uh, make a suture, a cross suture. And these are only what you need to do. After four months, you open and you found bone. You prepare the osteotomy, you insert the implant, and you can do the implant later. You can preserve the bone six months perfectly without any feeling of the socket, just the cloth. And so this is known as, as, as a pontic shield. So there are some cases of socket shield and apicoectomy. I want to show you cases like this. Hmm? There's a problem on the apical part, but you can do the socket shield. This is another patient in 2017. This premolar has a vertical fracture. So here we have problems on the buccal root, buccal root and in the palatal root. So after it is a measurement. Um, one, when you need to know what height do you do you have to do the apicoectomy and the length of the palatal root. So I extracted the, the mesodistal cut, extracted the palatal root with a periapical problem, and then I inserted the implant. You can see at seven millimeters, I did the incision just to open and look for the problem on the apical part. I grafted the membrane, PRF, and the suture. And you can see there is grafted and immediate implant. And you can see here after two months, in 2017, 2019, another CBCT with bone preservation and the final crown here in 2021, four years later with the buccal ball completely maintained. No graft at all. What about molars? Okay, before any discussion, I want to show this article because many people don't see the need to do a socket shield on a, on a molar area. Please follow this article. Dimensional rich alternations follow an immediate implant placement in molar extraction site. A six month prospective cohort study with surgical reentry. This is important. Surgical reentry, because we will measure exactly the bone. The case 12 molars, they have to have healthy neighbors hmm, with, uh, and they measure the keratinized gingiva and they will have to have a primary stability. So you extract, you open and you insert your implant. And then you do a guided bond re regeneration with a xenograft and a, a 
by your guide. But I have bad news for you because look what happened at six months. It was at the beginning and this is after six months. See the difference and what happened from buco bucolingual point of view. This distance is resolved. So they, they do the statistics of the measurements and they measure the distance from the external crest point to the implant. And they have from the internal crest, this is the, the thickness of the wall. And so they found that they have that the distance from 5.17 millimeters in average, it was reduced after six months to 2.5. And when the thickness of the wall is the two millimeters, the resorption is less, it's, it's four millimeters. But in both cases, you have 50% of the distance in resorption or 33% when the buccal wall is the two millimeters thick, okay? So you need to know this because you, you, you have to treat cases like this. Look at this, I have an endo problem with a periapical problem, no? We have to preserve the buccal bone. And so we decide to do a socket shield hmm, combined with an apicoectomy. So first of all, the horizontal cut, we remove the buccal, the, the coronal part, the mesiodistal cut. You can see we extract the, the palatal root and then we treat like this, the buccal roots with a diamond gourd. We I left the roots here, and then I put in the interceptum bone with expansion with the densa board. I did an expansion and I put the implant, and this distance is the prosthetic space. Okay, it's very important. This is space. And you can see here the implant and here the buccal roots. Also the same day I did the apicoectomy just to clean the apex and feel the apicoectomy. Just PRF and suture PRF at one month and at six months. Six months I open to uncover and then put a uh, an abutment, a multi-unit abutment, and um, a custom healing abutment. I tailor it one. And after a couple of weeks, I have this emergency profile. Look how nice we have this wall. And this is the crown, the final crown. The implant, there is also a sinus lift. But I want to show you these images. Look at this. Looks like a natural molar. This is the, the, the importance of doing this kind of technique. Can we do an osteotomy and do also socket shield? Of course. In what cases? Gummy smile. This patient was a patient who was pregnant and uh, we, 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 we can't do any x-rays. So uh, she had a problem that this uh, bridge was repeatedly decemented. So I studied the case and I said, I need to put, look at this, this is what she had. This was the prosthesis. And this was the roots that I cannot use it to do another fixed bridge. 
So uh, I said, I, I need to do socket shield and implant, but not at the same level of their roots because she has a gummy smile. So I use this surgical guide to have the new height of the, of the crowns, you see. Uh, the same day I extracted, I raised a flap, I inserted the implants, but look at this, how important. While the roots were there, I raised a flap and I put this, uh, the, the new, uh, next of the of the teeth you see so i need to know three millimeters above this aesthetic uh, zenith of the teeth a line so then i cut in it along this line with a burr surgical burr and then begin treating each root okay and all of them, I was cutting the palatal part. And also look at this, I'm doing C, the C shape because I want to maintain as much as possible of the vascularization for the interproximal papilla head. Okay. After extracting the palatal parts of the roots, they were very short because you, you cut the bone horizontally. And look at the difference between the root that is horizontally cut and then beveled. Here we have the root that is beveled with an inclination because you give a prosthetic space. Okay. These are socket shield prepared and these are shields unprepared. And also I did apicoectomies on those roots. And then I close, and this is the evolution, the case, the, the shields, and after the emergency profiles. Look at this, this is a provisional, and we are taking the impressions to maintain the emergency profile. And this is the image we would like to have. We, we have this image without any feeling, without any graph, any, a soft graft. And we have this final result. And we have in the buccal of each implant bone. Okay. And the patient has this nice smile instead of the do we have problems and complications with these techniques? Of course, in every technique, we have problems and complications. But you need to know why do you have problems and how to solve the complications. So, which is the most common problem or complication? First of all, the inner exposure of the shield. We would like to have this gingiva covering all over the shield. But sometimes we found this, that the shield is exposed. So, which is the cause? The cause is that the abutment or the, or the, or the provisional is touching the shield or the provisional segment between crown and shield. And so if you don't let space to the gum to grow, you will expose your abutment. So the solution is to grind the shield. You can see here, how should it be the provisional? If the provisional touches the shield, you will have exposed the shield. Second problem, external exposition of the shield. Sometimes we look at this, oh, there is some shield on buccal. Okay, my first solution, uh, which is the cause? 
Sometimes the provisional prosthesis is making pressure over the shield. And so it protrudes on the part outside the bone. My first solution was to green the shield with a diamond board with some anesthetic like this and do a small suture. But this is not a very good solution. The best solution is different. Why? Because when you touch the keratinized gingiva, you can see a scar that takes longer to disappear. So when you have this, an external shield exposition, the best, the best solution is to rise a mini flap like this. You rise a mini flap and then you remodel the shield, the protruding shield, and then you just suture and there is no problem. Uh, here, I look at the case in the image that is below. You can see this was a tough case. This patient needs to have an implant bridge, but I have to do I, in this part uh, a block graft, a connected tissue graft, and after four months, another connected tissue graft just to have a, a better profile. But I want you to stop one minute, one second, and see if you can perceive the difference between this part, this keratinized gingiva, original keratinized gingiva, and this one that is made out of connecting tissue graph. You see, this is not the same. If, if we don't have this part, you say, oh, this is nice. I like it, the emergency profile. Yes, I like it, but I prefer this kind of material, okay? This is the end. This was the beginning. Look at this, the depression, and this is the end. It's uh, nice, but this is better. This is much more better, okay? You cannot understand, you cannot perceive the difference between a teeth, a tooth, and an implant here. And this is the place where we rise and you can see there is no scars. This is the final case. This is nice, yes, but this is more beautiful. You, you can see this is like a skin of an orange, okay? That, that says that this is a healthy gingiva. And this is flat. This is not keratinized gingiva. Okay. The volume, yes, are almost the same size, but the quality of the surface is different. This is the good one, and this is the substitute. This is not, it's like a, I, I used to say, this is a decaffeinated cafe. <laughs> it's like Coke without caffeine. Yes, it's like a smoke without nicotine. You understand? This is looks like, but it's not the same. Okay. Well, and in some cases, I do socket chill over in cases that the smile line is very low and the bone is very, very up. But I do the same socket shield in this part. Why? Because I want to have roots on the buccal part of my implants because I know that it won't make a resorption of the bone in the next 10 or 20 years. Not like in the cases I show at the beginning, that after 12 years, you have resorption, okay? So look at this, like here's another case. The, uh, I maintain roots here. Hmm? Here there are roots, submerged roots and socket shields, just to have this. The patient doesn't show when it smiles, but here the bone is maintained by the socket shield technique. Look at this, there is socket shield and also uh, roots in between to maintain the profile of the bone. So 
after my conference. You have two ways. I used to have one way many years ago. On eight years ago, I used to do this. I used to need two millimeters on the book because I thought that it was important, this distance. But now what I say is I don't need two millimeters. I need point oh, point 0.8 millimeters because this is the natural thickness and I need the buccal root to stay there because the root has the PDL and the PDL give vascularization to the buccal bone and it won't resolve. So I need to do the PET, everything I can, I do socket shield in all my cases since eight years. Okay, which are the conclusions? First of all, you have to understand that a natural process cannot be stopped by any material. The bone is resolved and so you cannot stop this process. Second, it's better to preserve than to regenerate what was already there. The bone was there and you kill it by simply extracting the root. Third, partial extraction therapies are here to stay and has more than 10 years with us. And four, by gently preserving the bone, our implantology will find a way to last. And the last thought that belongs to my friend, Chuck Schwimmer, biology is not a democracy. Things are like this, this is biology. You cannot say, I, I, I don't like it. It's like this, take it or leave it. But if you want to preserve bone, you have to maintain the roots. Thanks for your kind attention, my friends. And I want, if you want to know more, I wrote a book with more cases, with 100 cases of socket shield. And in a, in a, you can find it very simple because it's the socketshield.com. And this is an electronic book where you can find cases and, uh, and the description of the technique. Hmm? Today, I give a resume of all of this, but you can do it perfectly. You can see there are cases and cases. This is a most difficult case, a canine, because when you strike a canine, the buccal root is so thin that you will have a depression, a buccal depression, a horrible buccal depression. Here, in this case, I had to do an apicoectomy simultaneously. And finally, I did and I preserve the buccal bone. Okay, and you can see the implant, the root, and the bone. At three months and at the end. See you some days if you come to Vigo in Spain. In the north of Spain, I live there at Vigo. We are beside the sea. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Gurian. So, Dr. Arnold was a really nice presentation. So, Doc, it was really, really nice. Uh, uh, many people talk about socket shield and we see socket shield done, and most of the times nobody explains cross constant uh, what you explained in this lecture. And uh, now I have some questions from the audience for you. First of all, have you done any implants to impacted teeth? Can you repeat the question because I, I didn't listen. Have you done any implants through infected teeth? Oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. I I did uh, on impacted teeth. I I also did uh, a transdental implant, and there is no problem. There is a person, a, a, a French person, that the name is Michel Dabarfana that made, uh, they had experience with more than 12 years with impacted teeth. Implants through impacted canines with a follow-up of more than 12 years. Which is really very good because, you know, 
we don't have the the, uh, the certainty that our our extraction will uh, you know result in the same success after extracting the canine and uh, you know mm -hmm. placing the implant uh, with uh, having a little bigger surgery. Yeah. So, uh, another question from Dr. Christoph. What is your rationale for using xenograft? Because I see that you have used it in your cases. And why not allograft materials? Uh, I, I don't use xenograft anymore. No, no. Since many years, never use xenograft. Uh, <laughs> look at me. I'm very, very old. I, I don't look like, but I'm very old. So I begin 25 years ago using what we only have that was by us, xenograph. This was the first graph, and I use it. I use two or three kilos, kilograms of, in my life, but I don't use it anymore. No, no, because um, it, it never turns over. You, it never remodel, never. So yeah. you you don't have to use it. You can use it allograft. This is good. But what I'm doing uh, using more is um, a synthetic um, graft. The, uh, it's a crystal, biocrystal. Now the the name is uh, Nova Bone. It's a fourth generation crystal, biocrystal, and this is, I like very much. Yes. I can't agree more. I won't say any more because I wouldn't like to, you know, spoil it. Uh, also, uh, well, I can't thank you more uh, for being with us today. It was a long and very interesting presentation, and I hope to, to visit you someday and also to have the possibility to, you know, speak another time together. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much, Gurian, for your help. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah.